Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to start us off with a little story. Um, back when I was a young whippersnapper, um, freshman in college, I traveled a whole 40 minutes away to go to college, way far away from home. And I went to Illinois State University, and as a freshman, I went in, and God had done this miracle in my heart. Um, I was a real shy kid in junior high and high school, but something just shifted, and I was trying to build as much friendship as I possibly could. And I just wanted connection, and I was excited to be a believer, and I was excited to be around college-level believers who really knew how to walk with God, amen? So I, I, I was just going to connect with them. And I remember going to this one Christian group. It was called The Navigators, and I met all these people, but I remember this one guy, Joe, Joe Kaliza, and he was a senior, and seniors were so cool. And seniors knew everything because they were three years older than me, and I almost knew everything, but they for sure knew everything, right? And so I wanted to hang out with this guy, because there was just, there was a way about him when he talked about the scripture, when he talked about the Lord, and I could just tell he loved Jesus for real, and I wanted some of that to rub off on me. And so I remember uh, going and facing him one night at, at this meeting that we had, and, and, and I said, you know what, I'd really like to connect with you. And it wasn't a full-blown marriage proposal at the time, but I was trying to communicate that I wanted to be in his circle somehow. And he kind of stopped the conversation and said, you know what, um, I'm, I'm going to get together with you, and we're going to talk about this. And I'm like, okay. And he actually made an appointment with me. And as a freshman, I didn't have many appointments other than the doctor. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and he made an appointment with me, and he wanted to talk one-on-one -on -one about it. And that seemed weird and formal, but he's a senior, and se it must be right, right? And so we met, and we talked. And I remember him coming in and saying, Josh, you're a great guy. But he said, I just don't have space in my life right now for a new friend. We can't hang out, sorry. And I gave my engagement ring back, <laughs> or he gave it back. It was a hard conversation. And uh, I mean, he could have put some softer stuff, I'll, I'll say that, into the conversation to help. But how, how dare you? Could I just say that? How dare you? You're a Christian. I have a need. See a need, meet a need. Right? Like if you see, like here I am, I'm asking for help. Don't you have to help? And see, I had no framework for that. I had no framework for a boundary. I had no framework for a no in, in a relationship. It was tough on me. I didn't know Christians were allowed to say that. Here's the phrase we're going to go over today. My doors always open. My door's always open. In this series, we've been talking about different phrases that our culture uses inside of relationships, and sometimes those things are dysfunctional. Today, it's my door's always open, and we use this in friendship land a bit, and I think it's dysfunctional. Like, in a job context, if you're a supervisor, you're a boss, and you've got people that you're responsible for, and you're paid to be responsible for them, to answer their questions, solve their problems, make sure everything continues to flow right, you should say, my door is always open, right? Like, that makes sense. Even as parents with your kids, again, another limited context, you should always be available for them. I know if my college-age kids call, I want to be there at all times. And I think that's good. But I think we've taken a business principle and a principle that works in certain contexts, and we've brought it over into our general relationship context, and we think that it ought to work. And it doesn't. My door's always open. My world is always available to anybody who might come up. And I will give of myself emotionally and relationally to whatever need there is, that will lead you to burnout. Amen. That will lead you to burnout eventually. Um, not only will it lead you to a crash emotionally, and some of you guys have experienced this before, it will also lead to emotional unavailability. Because what you will end up doing, and what undergirds this, and we're going to explore this today, is you are a finite person with limited resources. 
And once you expend all of those resources, you're out. And when you're out, and then you show up to the living room that night, and your kids need you, your spouse needs you, you know what you do. You're like, no, no, not now. There's the TV. Why? It's not because you love TV. It's because you're out. And truthfully, this is a lot of honesty this early in the message, right? Truthfully, I fail at that a lot. But I know that those days are not good days. And I want as many good days as I possibly can. And you know what a good day is? A good day is me showing up at the back door, walking in from the garage, and having some in my tank left over. And so we have to manage that. We have to watch out for that. So where we are insane, Jesus is always sane. Amen? Where we are foolish and unwise, Jesus is always wise, and he's always going to speak his wisdom to us. So let's go to the word of God. This is Mark chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, turn to it. If you've got a Bible app, I highly recommend that as well. This is Capernaum. Capernaum was a city that Jesus went to and did some ministry at. Peter lived there. It says that evening, verse 32, after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. And the whole town gathered at the door to watch. Can you imagine the whole town is there? And so Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Keep going, verse 35. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. And later, Simon and the others went out to find him. Where did he go? And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Where'd you go? Jesus? Come on, Jesus? Come on. What's happening here? So the movement is building. Jesus' reputation, his fame. Everybody in this town wants their miracle. And the more he does miracles, and they're lined up outside of this house, the more he's doing miracles, the more people figure out, I need my miracle too. Right, And this was never going to end. This was just going to keep going. And so when he wakes up the next morning, he doesn't get right back to the grindstone, does he? No, he goes off alone to pray. Why? Because Jesus, and this is going to mess with your theology, Jesus had a limited emotional tank when he walked the earth. And when Jesus' emotional tank got full, and you see it all throughout the Gospels, he goes off alone and spends time with the Father. He goes off to rebuild and to restore and to refill. And there's one way that that happens for him, and it's time with God the Father. And Peter shows up at the door like he's in the middle of Jesus' quiet time, for heaven's sake. He's interrupted him. And he's like, everybody's looking for you. And there's so much built into that phrase, isn't there? Where have you been? How dare you, Joe Kaliza? right? Look at what Jesus says next. Verse 38, Jesus replied, we must go on to the other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And, and what it doesn't say there that we need like bolded right now is that Jesus left the town. At that moment, Peter's there saying, everybody's looking for you. They want more. And Jesus is like, time to leave. That's hard. Jesus left needy people. Jesus walked away from miracles that could have happened had not yet happened. This is going to mess with us today. It's going to mess with us, I think, in a good way. Because I think there's some nuance here, but I think we need the nuance. Because sometimes, I think in our culture, guys, please hear me on this. I think we oversimplify life sometimes to make it more digestible in 30-second YouTube videos. And I think some of what we cut out in the editing room is really critical for wise living. So I'm going to try to make this, mercifully, a little bit more complex because I think the sanity is there. Jesus loved people. Jesus is full of compassion. Peter tells us, it is our Lord's will that none should perish. Our God loves everyone. But as Jesus walked the earth and showed us an example of how to live, Jesus lived a limited life on purpose. And he walked away. 
some of you guys know from the, the Gospels, Jesus only lived three adult years of ministry, right? You got his childhood and his teens and his 20s. We're not told very much about any of that. And at 33 years old, Jesus dies on a cross. There's three years in between where all of the stuff in the Gospels really happens. And you're like, three years, that's not much, God. Like, if I was setting the Jesus itinerary, I would have given him a little bit more time. Yes? Like, Jesus, if you could have just had five years, not three, you probably could have spent longer in Capernaum and healed everybody. Like, what about 10 years? 10 years, you could have visited a lot more towns. A lot more people would have gotten stuff. You could have even done, like, financial counseling for people. It would have been great. Why not 50 years, Jesus? Why not 100 years, Jesus? Why such a limited amount of time? Not only that, but why do you have to heal people one at a time? Why not, you know what I mean? It's like, it's each individual who lays hands on them and stuff like that. It's like, that's so inefficient, isn't, isn't it? It's like, why not just do like splash healing? Why not just like walk up? to Capernaum, just wave your hands around, and everybody gets a miracle, right? Like, why not do that? Like, in the Avengers, and I'm a superhero guy, so in the Avengers, you know who the lamest guy is on the Avengers? Hawkeye. I love Hawkeye. He, he's got great personality, but you know what that means, right? Like, Hawkeye, he, he's only got an arrow. He shoots one guy. It's over. But it's like, what happens if you got an army of thousands coming at you? You know Thanos, right? Like, like you, what you need is Thor with a big hammer and it's splash damage. That's what you need. Why doesn't Jesus have splash healing? You geeks in the room. Why not? Because he could have. Ooh, that's the important point. He could have. There were no actual limitations on Jesus. All his limitations are chosen for a reason. Okay, now go to Luke 4. So this is going to be a second town that he visits after Capernaum. And this is Nazareth. This is his hometown. And this is where he grew up. Okay, so Jesus like grew up in this town. People saw him playing in the street, fighting with his sister, all that kind of stuff. And it's going to mess with their ability to believe that he's God. So look at verse 23. Then Jesus said to them, he's in the synagogue talking to them. He says, you will undoubtedly quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those that you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Now for you Bible interpreters out there, you know The clear interpretation of this passage is Jesus is saying, listen, you're in my hometown. You watched me grow up. You're not going to be able to bring faith to the equation and give God glory in the right way. So then he keeps talking, verse 25. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time. Sounds like he's changing the topic. He's not. He's giving them an example. This Old Testament prophet, is Elijah, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon, and many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. So, so Jesus is saying, hey, even with the Old Testament prophets, sometimes they didn't bring all the miracles to their hometowns or even their home countries. And that's what we're supposed to get from that. But I think there's a tiny bit more. Notice what he says. He says Elijah, massively powerful Old Testament prophet. He he actually even raised the dead at one point. Crazy stuff. And for three and a half years during a famine, which is economic collapse, by the way, a really hard time on that country, Elijah gets sent to one widow and her son in Gentile, that's foreign territory. And he stays there and he does all the miracles for this one tiny family. And Jesus is like, what about all the other widows? What about all the other needs? See, it's so easy for us in our modern fixation on numbers to say if somebody's got miracle working ability, That means it should be available to all. So easy for us to look at it that way. And Jesus is like, no. And again, this is going to mess with us today. 
what Jesus is going to say is it's not see a need, meet a need. What it is is God the Father sets my mission for me, and I go and I do those things. It's obedience. It's not just being guided by our compassion. Are you okay? That's a tough one. Because if you don't have a supernatural God who's actually there, actually directing you, that sounds like a really scary principle. But the truth is, he is there. And if you listen to him, he will direct you. And he will set your mission for you. And you do need to obey him. And he not only will send you on mission to be compassionate to people and to be his hands and feet to them, but he'll breathe sanity into your life as well. Elijah did not have an open door policy, and neither did Jesus. Hmm. Verse 28. When the people heard him say all this, they were really happy about it. Joking. The people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him, forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built, and they intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Jesus tried to to set up a boundary with people, and they tried to murder him. That's a big response. Okay? Just very, very briefly. Some of you in your families and friends and relationships, you've tried to set healthy boundaries before, and maybe, maybe you could have set it nicer, like Joe Caliza could have set it nicer, right? Like maybe you could have done that. But when you tried, they responded negatively. And sometimes people are responding to the fact that they didn't see that coming. They don't have a theology for this. They don't understand. They take it as lack of love. And sometimes it's not lack of love. Let's hope they don't murder you. Amen? Amen. Get the big picture on Jesus. I'm going to try to explain this nuance here. The big picture on Jesus is that Jesus, theologically, right now today, he sits down at the right hand of God the Father in the throne room of heaven. Amen? And he sits down because it symbolizes that the overall work is done. He died for our sins once for all. It's done. So he sits but it doesn't mean he's not active because he's connected. He's connected to every one of his children in prayer. Amen? Right? Like millions of us can simultaneously pray to Jesus and he's got an open door policy. He hears us. He just does. The scripture tells us so. And so he's connected right now to all of our heartaches, all of our joys, all of our needs, all of our pains, everything. That's Jesus now. But when Jesus chose to become a man, and this is where it starts to mess with us, he chose a limited life. I like some of you theological people, you know, God can be anywhere. He is omnipresent. But when Jesus became man, one of the ways that he became man and took the form of a servant, Philippians tells us, is that he chose to be limited in time and space to one body. Yes? I know it's a lot, but he also chose to have a limited emotional tank. And he also chose to limit his relationships. Why? Lack of love? No. No. To show us. To show us how this is done. To show us the example, the important human example. Think about even his disciples. He chose 12 why didn't you choose a hundred disciples, Jesus? Come on. Why didn't you choose a thousand? Don't you think the people who wanted to be that close to Jesus, the candidates, don't you think they lined up? Don't you think there were people who were disappointed that they get, didn't get to be in his inner circle? <sighs> of course there were. But Jesus entrusted all people to God the Father. And I'll say this. Jesus said no to countless possible friendships while he walked the earth. And if you are a recovering codependent and people pleaser like me, you really need to hear that. Really need to hear that. Gary Thomas says it this way. He says, sometimes to follow in the footsteps of Jesus is to walk away from others or to let them walk away from us. (sighs) 
it sounds like the opposite of compassion, doesn't it? And, and, and let me tell you, when I was starting out in my Christian life, what I saw in my own self and I saw in others around me a lot of times was people who were so self-focused and there was no compassion there. Can we be honest about this? Living for themselves. Our culture teaches us that, to live for ourselves. And so much about coming to Jesus and seeing his example in the early days is to stop being so self-centered and to become focused on other people and to truly empathize with them. And that is a massive shift. And then you start caring for people and there's excitement and there's a thrill and there's joy to it, isn't there? And you start seeing in your life, you're like, this is what Jesus used to do. And it's like, and I'm seeing Jesus in me. Like some of you guys, you, you struggle to know whether or not you're saved. Start walking like Jesus. It helps a lot. Because the more you start walking like Jesus, the more you see your heart start to come alive, the more you get the inner witness. It's like, oh yeah, I have changed. So it's a shift to compassion. And it's massive. And God, our Lord, wills that none should perish in Peter. So that's all good. But if you've got people-pleasing, codependent tendencies, you start down that road of compassion and you never stop. And you turn it into an open door policy and you say, not only will I love people, but I'll love all the people and I'll love every single person who ever walks up. And then you start to get overwhelmed. And there's got to be sanity and it runs deep in us. Acts 20 verse 32, look at this. This is Paul talking. It's right before Paul goes to Rome and he's martyred for the sake of Christ. And he's got a group of elders here. These are the Ephesian elders. He planted this church. And these church leaders, he's just told them that he's about to die. And look at what he says. He says, I now entrust you to God and to the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. What Paul is saying is, I'm a very compassionate guy, and I love you very much, and I would do anything for you, but I'm about to leave this world, and I won't be able to do anything for you anymore. And what do I do with that as a parent who cares about you? I have to entrust you to the Father. And that right there, that's the core of this whole thing. It's the fact that as Christians and as, let's just say, good people, You are finite. You're limited. And that's something not to reject, but to embrace. It's healthy to embrace that. You remember the old Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby? Anybody remember that song? (laughs) It's about religious people. Did you know that? (laughs) Eleanor Rigby. And and the refrain that they keep singing through the song is, Oh, look at all the lonely people. Oh, look at all the lonely people. And it's just, this, it's just this perspective of it's like the older I get, the more I see all the needs that are before me. And I want to I wanna hug them all. Do you feel that? I want to hug them all. But I can't. I can't. Because I run out of steam and I run out of emotional energy. And then I got nothing left for the people that are nearest and dearest to me that God has called me to take care of. And so I'm a finite person in what feels sometimes like an infinite world. And you know what it does is it drives me to a place. It drives me to a place of great humility where I start to realize for the very first time, watch this, I am not their savior. Only he is. What has to be there as the bedrock foundation for you as a Christian to ever say no to another person is that I have entrusted you to the Father, and you are always in his hands anyway. I am only his hands and feet if ever he calls me to be available to you. But I'm not the Savior of the world, and I'm not your Savior. This is, this is deep waters, I know. I can't be everyone's friend. I can't solve everyone's problems. And when I find my limits, I entrust people to Almighty God. And when I find my limits, I end up worshiping the unlimited one. Say this for me out loud. There's only one infinite. There's only one infinite. And I'm not him. Yeah. Some of us need to wake up every morning saying that. 
It's only one infinite in this universe, and I'm not him. And if you, you remember Jesus' high priestly prayer right before he went to the cross in John 15, what does he do? He spends this massive prayer praying to God the Father to take care of the early church and to take care of all of us for generations to come because he was entrusting us to the Father. If you embrace a finite life, I would say this to you. It will keep you from burning out. You'll start thinking in terms of an emotional budget that you have for yourself. Emotional budget. Did you hear that? Emotional budget. The reason I say it that way is because some of you are introverts like me. You're like, no, you're not an introvert. You're friendly. It's like, I'm an introvert. What you don't know is that I go home and I'm a hobbit in a cave on Sunday afternoons and I'm trying to rebuild, right? Because it wears me out. And, and I love people, but people rob my tank. I take, it, take my tank down. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's just the way that I'm built. But some of you are extroverts and you're around people and it fires you up. And you're exhausted and you're like, where's the party at? Because you just want more people. So it's like, I know we've all got different tanks. I get that. You've got to know what your tank is, and you've got to know when you're reaching E. Have a finite friendship life because it will keep you from reaching E too quickly, keep you from burning out. Next, it will keep you emotionally present for those that need you. Most of our families, especially if we've got young kids at home, the truth is, there is a minimum number of nights per week that you should be in your living room present for your family to function, for your marriage to function. It's just the truth. And you're like, well, they didn't ask for anything. They didn't ask for an appointment. They shouldn't need an appointment with you. You should be present. Right? And you can be if you're monitoring your tank. Because guess what? This is the way kids work, especially so does your wife. She won't wait. She won't wait for an appointed moment. It's when she feels it. It's when the little ones, when they feel it and they want to express it. And if you're not present, you'll miss it. It's just the truth. Next, keep the lonely ones from getting frustrated. Sometimes we want to say yes to everybody and have the open door policy. And what we end up doing is giving everybody an absolute minimum of us. And it's not enough to sustain them. And you end up starving them in the long run when you really should set that person free right on down the line to get themselves to a healthy friendship. Ooh. Next. Forces you to see your limits and to worship God. I am not the Savior. He's the Savior. Say it every single morning. Next. I love what Proverbs says here. Proverbs 18.24. It says, A person with many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That should say, be, say then a brother, than to a brother. And that's not her fault. That's mine. I make the slides. So, <laughs> Notice how the Hebrew poetry there juxtaposes those two phrases. You can live a life with many companions, mile wide and an inch deep of relationships. And you might come to ruin. Why? Because when the hard times come, those people won't know how to be there for you. You haven't built that kind of depth with them. But there's a friend. Notice a friend, a few friends that stick closer than a brother. And that's what you need to be about, right? Companion, I love the word companion versus friend there. I'm going to use that just a little bit with us here. How many companions do you have? How many Facebook companions do you have? How many Instagram companions do you have? Right? How many people, how many companions do you have at school and Little League and PTA and all the committees? How many do you have? How many people do you have in the community? How many companions do you have in the neighborhood, the people that you don't like but you still talk to, right? How many companions do you have at church? How many companions do you have at school? Do you see all the circles that you have and all the little connections that you've got? It's probably hundreds. It might be a thousand. I don't know. But you've got lots of them. And you can't pour into every single one of them. You won't make it. Blueberry muffins are the best muffins. Okay. Right. I'm a food guy. Blueberry muffins are the best muffins. There's a lot of muffins, and muffins can be good, but blueberry. 
So here's what happens is you're making the blueberry batter and that's great, but then you hit this critical decision moment in the blueberry muffin process. How many of the tins do I pour into? Do I pour into, I don't know, 32 tins so that everybody gets a little, what is that, a muffet would be left over? <laughs> or do I pull, pour it all into six or even four overflowing, wonderful blueberry muffins? <laughs> and you know the answer. But our culture doesn't understand this. And our culture says, no, 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 it's got to be everybody. It's got to be everything all the time. And we're constantly spread, spreading ourselves way, way too thin. And we don't understand why we don't have the relationships our parents and grandparents did. And we focus. A um, guy named Todd. I've told this story before. Todd and I had a relationship, still do, still good friends. We had this agreement. Anything ever happens with my family, I can call you. You're going to come now. And anything ever happens with your family, you can call me, and I'm going to come now. I can't do that with 100 people, but I do it with Todd. And when you do that with one person, right, and then Jake had to go into the emergency room one night, and we had uh, Davey was just a baby, and she's in a crib. I call Todd at 3 in the morning. And I'm like, you got to come over across town, man. Sleep on my couch. And he comes walking in, groggy and tired, and sleeps on my couch and protects my baby girl while mom and I take son to the ER. Who's going to do that for you? A guy named Jason. And Jason's this wonderful guy, and we got close, and he could tell me truth. And there was this time where Linda and I were driving on the highway, and I was driving, and she was the passenger, and, and while that was happening, there was this uh, motorcycle was, was in the lane in front of us, and I'm driving up a very respectable distance from the motorcycle, very safe distance, but Linda didn't think so, and she was wrong, and I was right. <laughs> and I, I told her that, and... And she said it a few different times. And at one point in the conversation, very respectfully, with good tone, um, I just said, you know, if it bothers you so much, you could just shut your eyes. <laughs> if you're not yet married, that was a bad idea. <laughs> So we got this good relationship with Jason and his wife, Marla, and we're hanging out that next week, and we're talking about our marriages and stuff, and Linda starts to tell the story, which I don't have a problem with her telling the story because it, very clearly she was wrong and I was right. And so she's telling the whole story to them, and Jason just looks right over at me and says, True Blood, you cannot say that to Linda. And I don't know why I couldn't hear it from her, but I could hear it from him. And... Maybe that's pride in me. I, I mean, I don't know. But he had the ability to speak hard truth to me, and I took it, and I was better for it. How many people in your life can look you dead in the eye and tell you a hard truth about yourself? Right? You're not going to get Todd on the couch or Jason telling you the truth with 32 muffets from your batter. You're going to have to invest and it's going to take time, and there's going to be failures along the way, and some of you have been through that, and you've had failures before, and you didn't like it, and I totally get it. I totally understand, but you're going to have to be courageous again. You're going to have to try again. You're going to have to invest in friendships that may not work out, may not turn into a Todd or a Jason, but you're still going to have to try because it's worth it. Go back to Proverbs let me just give you this smattering of wonderful wisdom from Proverbs here. We are going to do a new series, by the way, in two weeks, all on the book of Proverbs. This is just a taster. A good friend. So Proverbs is going to describe in eight different verses what a good friend actually looks like. So some of you are thinking right now, it's like, okay, if I invest, who do I invest in? A good friend, number one, makes you wise. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools 
suffers harm. Wise is such a big word, but you know what it means. It means not only do I have textbook wisdom, but I've taken it into myself and I walk in it now. And when you're around those kind of friends, they make you better. You should be around friends and investing in people that are making you better, making your relationships better. Next, they aren't after your stuff. You've had people in your life before, and what they were after was they were after something you had. They were after your money. They were after your house. They were after your boat. They were after your membership. They were after your influence or your title or whatever. In high school, everybody's after your popularity, right? And if you're not popular enough for them, they go to somebody else. We know that whole game. We're used to friends who want something from us. Proverbs is like, nope. Look for friends who love you for you. That's what you want. Next, a friend that isn't angry. Some of the people in our life, they're just always angry. There's, they're always complaining and telling us how bad of a person their spouse is. They're just always angry about it. Their boss is the most horrible person. No one ever gives them a chance. No one ever understands them. Or they're just always angry about politics or what's going on. They're just always angry. And there's something in that. And they'll rub off on you. That's not the friend for you. Next, they don't shame you. Whoever would foster love co covers over an offense. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. I love the picture of they cover over an offense. Amen? Because if you're going to do deep friendship with somebody, you're going to do stupid stuff. Amen. And when you do, you need somebody who does not shame you publicly. Amen? Not somebody who's like going to make you pay for it. No, it covers the offense. Like we'll work through it. We'll forgive. We'll get... Next, keeps your secret. A per perverse person stirs up conflict. A gossip separates close friends. If I share something deep with you, you've got to keep it for me. You can't share it with anybody else. It just destroys trust. The next one loves you in the hard times. Friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. I love that. Some of you, your brothers and sisters, you were born for their deepest trial. You were born to be there for them. That's the kind of friendship that I'm talking about. Next, tells you the truth. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. That was Jason in that moment. He gave me a friendship wound, didn't he? Like, I'm going to tell you the truth about yourself. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be good. Next, gives loving advice. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart. And the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt, their loving advice. It's hard to invest in relationships. Invest in ones, and then they move away. Invest in relationships, and it doesn't work out. Some of you have built wonderful relationships, friendships, just the deep ones I'm talking about, and then you had to PCS, and it broke your heart. Get that. But you can't give up. You know how many military families I talk about? They're like, we arrived in Lawton, Fort Sill, and we had given up. I get it. Human. But you can't. It's hard work. It's risky, and there are no guarantees. And friendship is painfully slow. It is a slow cooker, not a microwave. And you're like, why do I invest, 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 invest? And I don't feel like I've gotten anything back out again. Keep investing. Don't give up. And it's worth it all. It's worth your courage. I want to call out in all of you <clears throat> that courage is the thing that we do when we're terrified. Isn't it? People are always like, what? But you did the wonderful thing. Yep, I was terrified the whole time. Yeah. Courage is the decision and the action to not give in to those feelings. So I call you all to courage. I, I call you all to a limited life where you're not the savior of everybody. I call you all to the example of Jesus Christ who's our King and our Lord, amen? And he loved well, and he entrusted everyone 
to God. Love that about him. Would you guys stand right now? I know there's a lot of movement going on because people are getting baptized and they're all moving to that side of the room. It's going to be a fun moment. Let me pray for us and then we'll shift into that, okay? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your wisdom that brings sanity into our lives. I pray for a blessing of new friendships all across this church. Pray that you would give us the courage to walk in this, Lord, the way that you've told us. If there's anything that we misunderstand and don't get, Lord, I pray that you would explain it, show us. Jesus, come and heal our broken lives. In Christ's name, amen.